Welcome to week 12. It's almost there. Um, today we're tackling what a lot of people find one of the more challenging topics of SQL. But based on some of the assignments that have already been submitted, it's not that challenging because some people have already figured some of this out. So it's not the end of the world. Um, I'll try to make it as clear as I can. I'm not a big fan of the slide deck, so I'll be going through the slides pretty quick and then just doing demonstrations because I'd rather just do the demonstrations because it demonstrates what's actually happening instead of whatever that is on those slides. Um, once I'm done this, and normally this topic takes me a hair over an hour, um, I will be diving straight into week the rest of week 13, and I'm going to see how much of that I can get done. Because if I can get the, this today done and the rest of week 13 done, that means that week 14 you guys won't actually have a class. Because I'll do the review next week and any exam info next week. I'll be coming if anybody has questions on week 14. But actual new lecture material, there will be none if it all goes well. Okay. Today we talk about subqueries and joins. So when you want to pull data from more than one table at the same time, you have to connect the tables and you have two ways of doing it. Um, the subquery and the join. They both work with multiple tables, but they're definitely used for different purposes. So let's just say, we, you guys have seen something similar to this, this query we have up on the screen where we're grabbing a sum of an extended price where the skew's in this list of numbers. And we happen to know that the skews come from a specific department. So what we can do with a subquery is combine the two queries as one. So if when you look at what's on the slide, you'll see that the first part of the query is exactly like the first one was. The second one is exactly what the second query was, but what it's doing is we're combining them. You're doing a, what's called a subquery. So essentially, when you look at the screen, you'll notice that there's parentheses in here wrapping this SQL query. So what that's doing is it's just like what happens when you do, you know, pretty much math. You solve the parentheses first, take the results, apply it to the next layer out. So you solve from the innermost parentheses and you work your way outwards. Subqueries work the same way. So what this does, it'll take the value of the subquery, basically turn it into a list and feed that list to the outer query. So instead of having to write this and have to identify all of these values beforehand, we can tell it, hey, let's do it like that. Some people have already done this in lab seven for the last two questions where some people like, do it as two as two queries and people are like, what do you mean? Some people didn't ask me, they just actually wrote it as a subquery exactly, almost exactly like that. Um, I'll actually be doing that exact, exact example as an example. Um, so a subquery is often described as a nested query or a qu within a query. Um, you have to be aware though that subqueries are single table queries that only the columns from the outermost table will be returned. So you can't use a subquery. That's where I twice I don't like these slides because it's a lie. But you can't use a subquery to return values as part of the outer query. Only the top level query can be displayed in the query results. You can use multiple subqueries to process multiple tables, et cetera, et cetera. And this is just showing how you can just keep diving down and down. You can just keep nesting queries one after another. Lots of fun. Um, some people really, this is how they understand getting data from more than one table. It's not the most effective way because uh, it can be very expensive. Um, I'll be explaining that in a minute. Um, so. I'd rather just demonstrate the subquery stuff. It'll make way more sense. All right, flight DB, same one we've been using, so nothing new. 
So, so far, you guys have experienced this. There we go. We figured out ID 208. Then other people then did uh, And then they do something like this. Oh, it's not countries, it's from airports. Uh, duh. Let's try that one again. What do you mean active doesn't exist? What the heck's it called? Airports. Columns. Was it airlines? Oh, it's airlines. Uh, duh. Let's continue with the duh business here. Airlines. It really helps if you query the right table, you know. All right, here we go. There. This is basically the one of the last two questions of Lab 7, or very similar thereof. Now, there's a few ways we can skin this proverbial cat. Instead of doing it like this, we could have done... like this. And I'm actually breaking it down in multiple lines to make it a little easier to read. I'm going to get rid of that and I'm going to run it. And we have the exact same result. But in this time, we ran a single query. So what it's doing is it's returning the ID from the countries where the name's equal to Canada and it passes it to the outermost query. So it resolves the one on the inside first and then runs the one on the outside. That is a subquery used in a where clause. This is the most common use of a subquery, uh, which is why, you know, I just said a few minutes ago how I don't like the slide deck. It's because it's also not very, um, it's not covering everything a subquery can do. Basically five slides on subqueries. Um, remember last week, when I talked about how you can't aggregate an aggregate. Let, watch this one. Okay, so let's go select uh, sum. No, let's go select average. Mm, no, let's go uh, max elevation from, from airports. Okay, boom. So we got that. Now let's say we actually wanted to go a little bit better than this. We wanted to go country ID. Group by country ID. Again, boom. Now we got ourselves an aggregated column. So we're going to rename this as uh, max elevation. So now we have a nice subquery, or just normal query that gives us decent results that we can work with. However, now the question is, is I want to know what the average maximum elevation is. Doesn't sound like a really useful query, but it, you know, it's just for demonstrations. So we can create something called a derived table. We could have created a view of this, but the view is semi-permanent because the view is always going to be there. Let's just say we want to do this as a one-off. We can create what's called the derived table. I'm going to go select star from, open the parentheses, close the parentheses, and I'm going to give it a name. All right, so I'm going to run this, and poof, it doesn't look any different. However, I can now go. And that's not right. Uh, 
then now I've got the average maximum elevation. Now, some people are going to be going, huh? What's going on? What's happening when the subquery is part of the from clause? It runs this query, takes the results of it, puts it in memory, gives it a name, and at, th at this point, Postgres says, this is a table. For now. It then passes the results out, and the table is called elevation data. And you can then operate against it to your heart's content. This is known as a derived table. It allows you to run aggregates on an aggregate without having to create a view, without having to do any of that stuff. It's a cute trick. Works well. Now, I am going to um, extend this concept because um, let's go. I'm going to show you the last place a, a subquery can be used. Star, no, let's go select country ID, comma, elevation from airports. Okay, once again, nothing groundbreaking. I haven't taught you guys about joins yet, but let's just say I want to put up the name of the country. I can do that with a subquery. It's going to be a special kind of subquery. However, so I'm going to come here and go select name from countries where ID is equal to airports.country ID. And now I'm going to do this. And we have the name of the country. So I don't know why they took this particular item out of the list of topics to cover because it is one of the most useful subqueries you can use when you're generating data. For example, I want to, I'm populating a table. I have a series of values in one table and I want to reuse those, but I don't want to go hard-coded IDs. I can use something like this to extract the names. Yep. No, this, this is a subquery. It's not a derived table. Derived table only happens when it's part of the from clause. This is just a subquery. But we're doing a subquery as a value. So what's happening is it's running this query, but you'll notice that I'm referring to the outer query. This is known as what's called a correlated subquery. This is a very, very expensive query to run. It's running really fast on my laptop because it's a small database. You'll still see it took 371 milliseconds to run. <laughs> and it's not getting any faster, like 350, 390. So the reason why, no, that doesn't even really show it well. Um, so much for that. I was hoping it was going to be more fancy than that. Um, for every row I'm pulling from airports, it's running this query. So it is running, if I run this again, oops, rule one, don't highlight. So I see it's returning 8,107 rows. It's actually running 8,108 queries. As it has to run the inner query every single time the outer query runs because it's a correlated subquery. <laughs> Basically, it's saying that the inner query is using a value that is from outside itself. Therefore, it runs it last. So it runs the outer query first, grabs row one. It grabs the value from row one, the country ID from row one, and then executes the inner query, returns that value. Row two, same thing. Row three, same thing. There is limitations when you do this. You can only ever run return one value um, because it says it must return only one value. Unlike the 
when it was in here as a derived table, you could re-enter in many columns. Um, so this is just, the whole point of this is show you guys you can use subqueries in three places. The slide deck only talks about This version, which is a subquery in the where clause. And this one also has uh, limitations. Subquery must only return one column. You'll see that if you run it as part of the select at the top, one column. If it's part of the where, one column. When it's part of the from, you can return many columns because it, it's actually creating a temporary table to store the data. Um, they all serve different purposes. A derived query is really good if you're doing what's called ETL, electronic transform and load. So you have one set of data, but you need it to look like something else before you can insert it into another table. You can use a derived query for that. Um, when it's down here as part of the where clause, it's a good way to use a subquery as a target for uh, when there is no nice way of doing a join. And if you do it as part of the select statement in the field list, and by the way, that technique works with insert and update also. It will, um, what's what I'm looking for? Uh, with the insert and the update, if you use this up there, it only returns one value, but it's a really handy way to pull values from another source. Um, cleanly without having to worry about knowing the IDs. Because, you know, this database you guys are building for your assignment, I'm guessing most of your tables are going to have, you know, the source, the, like the parent tables are going to have like five rows. Who cares if there's only, you know, five values you have to track? Imagine you are importing a major piece of data that's coming in from, I don't know, some client. You might be getting millions of rows of data where you don't know what the IDs are. Therefore, in theory, you could use a subquery to connect things without having a structure that supports it. Any questions about the subqueries? It's just a technique. You'll be using it in lab nine. So you get the practice. I've shown you the three ways you can use it. In lab nine, the, you know, this is the most common one. And the other one is when you're using it as a derived table. So you can do an aggregate on an aggregate. Or, you know, some of the questions ask you, can you rewrite this question as a subquery? You could cheat and just take the original subquery and put it in the from clause and just bam, it's a subquery. There's a few ways of getting around that one. Um, the people grading those labs have all been told to be um, flexible with <laughs> the answers on those ones, because the point of the question is, can you demonstrate to understand how to use a subquery? Not, you know. All right. Now we're going to get down to the hard one. Subqueries people can understand fairly easily. You run a query, grab the results, give it to something else. It's a bit like how in Java you have a function that returns a value and then you use it in your code. Same idea. That's a subquery. Joins, on the other hand, uh, joins um, allows you to connect multiple tables and pull data from more than one table at once. So, we know that data stored in individual tables. You guys have been working on lab with FlightDB long enough now that you know there's multiple tables in there and they have different purposes. There's relationships between each of these tables. If you go back and look at the, there's an ERD for FlightDB included somewhere. And it shows how all the tables are connected. Um, when you want to pull data from more than one table, the proper method is using a join. And there's two styles of joins. There's the explicit and the implicit. 
The explicit join, the operator is used as part of the uh, SQL statement. So there's an actual keyword called join and it's used. With the implicit, the join keyword is not used. That is how we used to have to do joins before they added the word jo the keyword join to the SQL standard. It was terrible. It is very much not used anymore. Um, it's considered um, the very old fashioned, but of course, this slide deck being what it is, it covers implicit joins. Um, but I'll be talking about those in a few minutes. So there's a few kinds of joins. You have natural joins, inner joins, left and right outer joins, full and cross joins. So I'll be talking about all these in a minute. You can mix and match join types in a single query. You could have a like an inner join, an outer join, and even a natural join uh, in a single query. The SQL language is superbly flexible for this. Uh, sometimes you'll have queries that are pulling stuff from different places. Um, you can use joins on tables, used views, materialized views, and of course, because it's not including yet the rest of the slide deck, those derived tables I showed you guys a minute ago, you can use those in joins also. Um, because once it's in memory, it might as well be a table for the lifetime of that query. Okay. So natural joins. A uh, natural join creates a join based on the common attributes in the tables. Okay, so these are joins for lazy people. What it does, it looks at the structure of the database and says, hey, we are going to connect data based on fields of the same name and data type. So back in the day, the common practice was, let's say the table is called customers, the primary key would be called customer ID, all the foreign keys would be called customer ID. Magically, it would work. That particular way of doing things is not as popular as it was as modern design principles are taking effect. And the um, calcified designers are slowly retiring. Uh, the dinosaurs are going away. And, you know, the younger generation actually gets to have an opinion on how things are done. Um, so when you use natural join, Values of common columns are returned only once. Duplicate columns are eliminated. Um, if there's no common column, it turns into a Cartesian join, also known as a cross join. Um, we'll be talking about that in a minute. So that's the syntax. So you go select star from table one, natural join table two. What happens is it looks at table one, looks at table two. Are there any fields in here that have the exact same name? Let's use that to join. The reason why I say it's for lazy people, it's because then you don't need to actually understand the structure of the database. You can just let the database server take care of it for you. Um, how many of you have experienced letting your computer do whatever it wants and expect good results? How well has that gone for anybody in here who's had computers not be happy, especially HP users? Um, never let your HP do what it wants to do. <laughs> it's gonna eat itself. Um, uh, sorry, it's just, you know, I have history with HPs. Um, the problem is that it tries to get smart. Computers are not smart. Even when people think that they're getting smarter, they're not getting smarter. So, all right. So this is an implicit query. It's a Cartesian product. It's one of the dumbest things used. All it does is it gives you a matrix of the combination of every column join. So every single row is joined to every other row of the other table. I will actually create a database just to demonstrate this because just so you understand what's happening, it's actually way easier if I demonstrate this. Let's go use um, query tool in here. Okay, let's go. Why? Okay. Create table sweet. Sweet. Sure. Okay. 
face uh, mm, Those of you that play cards know where this is headed. Hearts, diamonds, heart club diamond, spade. Okay. In. Views. Is that what I called it? Face value? No, face value. Uh, one. Here we go. Copy. Damn. Two, three, four, five. You know what? We're only going to have six cards. It's going to be good enough. I'm going to run this and see if I got this right on the first try. Excellent. No errors. So now I'm going to go from. Heights, comma, face value, face value, face value. And look what do we get? We get a deck of cards. Because it's taking every value from one table and joining it to, where it's taking every row from table A and joining them to every row in table B. So I had four values in one table, six values in the other. How many rows did I get back? 24. Because it literally is multiplying the number of rows from one table with the other table. This is the best example because it's literally building a deck of cards SQL style. It's not very useful unless, like I said, you're trying to build a matrix. So you have all the values in one, all the values in the other. Obviously, somebody had a purpose for it because they created it as, a, as an option. Um, but that's also known as a Cartesian join. So if ever you see the word Cartesian on the exam, we're talking about cross joins. If you see the words cross join, it's probably talking about Cartesian results. Um, eh? No. Not at all. All right. So now this is an implicit join. So often you'll go on the internet and you ask Google Chan, hey, how do I do a join in SQL? And of course, Google being Google will sometimes pull stuff out of its ass and pull out record results from like 15 years ago. So the way an implicit join works is you have the normal select here. You have your from here, but you see it's a common delimited list. In the where clause, you do the correlation between the two tables. So you go select star from these two tables where this is the point of commonality between these two tables. It still works today. It's never going away. There's so much old code written that uses this technique that they cannot get rid of it. When I went through school, this is how I learned to do joins. Don't be like Dan. That was 20, oh my, 20, almost 27 years ago. So when I learned SQL, this is how I had to do joins. One table, not a problem. Let's say you're joining five tables. You got a bunch of where clauses. Here's the problem with this technique. It reads everything from table A, everything from table B, everything from table C, and then it starts filtering with the where clause. Table A has a million rows. Table B has a million rows. Table C has a million rows. It's got to go through 3 million rows and filter and figure everything, how everything's connected before it gets around to doing anything else. But it's got to read all 3 million rows first. Implicit joins. They're stupid expensive to run. Most database servers have gotten very smart and very effective at running them. So they're expensive, but not as expensive as they used to be. 
Well, I'll get around to the inner join in a minute. It's just essentially all implicit joins in anything but Oracle are inner joins. Because nothing but Oracle gave us a, a method to actually do outer joins. Um, Oracle did outer joins, which I'll be talking about in a bit, uh, in a very strange way. You had asterisks. So not only did you have the field names and the column names and the table names and that stuff in there, you also had like an asterisk floating around to tell you which side was the outer join. It was terrible, almost impossible to read. So if it doesn't have the keyword join, it's an implicit join. I frown upon implicit joins because they're just terrible to work with. And they give us more slides. So an inner join is also known as an equijoin. An equijoin uses val field values and tables that are equal. That means it will only pull values for values that exist in both tables. It returns all requested results, including values of common columns. Um, you can join multiple tables at once. Actually, I'll be demonstrating that. Um, this is another implicit join. Great. So now I'm going to use the join on clause. Um, so join on, which is the proper modern way of doing join. So whatever you just finished watching, and you never saw it. It's not going to be on the test. I just want to get rid of those slides, but apparently I'm not allowed to. Um, they are pointless. So the SQL join keyword is placed between table names in a from clause. So it replaces that comma that you saw in the previous slides. Uh, the on keyword is replaces what was in the where clause. The where clause is no longer used as part of the join, which makes it easier to read what's actually happening. Um, the explicit SQL join on syntax is considered, it's currently considered, no, it's just considered. It's not currently, it always will be. Considered the proper way to do joins. And the old method is considered archaic and old, but it still works because database people were smart and they decided to make things backwards compatible because some people refuse to learn how to do things the modern way. All right. So I'm just going to go do a bunch of joins on screen instead of using the slides. It'll just go better. All right. Let's go airports. So, so far, so good, right? It's nothing you haven't seen. Uh, oh, I'm in the wrong table. Database, hang on. Don't save. Okay. Select star from airports. Boom. So let's just say, I just want to know the uh, name and the city airport and the country of the airport. Earlier, I used a correlated subquery to pull this off. The proper way to do it would be to do a join. So I'm going to go join countries on countries.id is equal to airports.id. And now I can throw in the countries.name. And actually, I'm going to hit go, and I got a syntax error because name is ambiguous. Can somebody tell me why, what that might mean? Can somebody, you know, use a little deductive reasoning? Sure. The field's called the same in both tables. Database server being what it is, it goes, brah, which name do you want? Instead of trying to get clever, it says, you know what? I don't know what you want. You tell me what you want. So how do you tell it which one you want? You prefix it with the table name. So that says we want the airport's name and the country's name. So we hit go. And now here we go. We got the country. We got the name of the airport, the city. But now the other problem we have is we have a name twice. So this is where our happy little alias is. Come in, and now we can have nice little. 
now let me highlight what's what's actually happening here. So we're pulling the airport name, the country ID. Notice I didn't need to prefix country ID because country ID only exists in airports for now. We'll get to that in a minute. And we're grabbing the name of the country, so countries.name from airports. So I'm saying, okay, start from the airport. Now we're going to join countries. So that means I want to retrieve data from both airports and countries. The on part of this, so this last bit here, tells the SQL interpreter this is how they're connected. This is the point of commonality between these two tables. This is where a lot of students struggle, is understanding what the point of commonality is, which, fine, understandable, which is why you normally have an ERD. FlightDB did come with a diagram. PG Admin also has an ERD tool, which allows you to look at a really ugly version of the diagram. You know, they've been working on this for years and it still looks like shit. Um, but you can still use this at least to figure out how things are connected, right? So we got our countries and we have our foreign keys right here. And it'll show down here that the foreign keys are gray. So you can see that this is a foreign key. You can see this is the parent. Um, it's good enough to actually do a connect to keys type view. So you'll see that the lines actually go right to there. So you can use the built-in ERD tool in PG Admin to figure out the relationships. MySQL Workbench has something similar. It just uses the diagramming tool. Um, you know, SQL Server has this, Oracle has this, they all have this. So if you're not sure, you can use the built-in diagramming tool to sort out what the relationships are. Now, this is where I'm gonna talk about how we can join as many table so I'm not going to go join flights on uh, flights. Now, flights is weird because the flights table, sorry, routes, not flights, routes. The routes table has two foreign keys. Well, more than two, but two. And uh, no, that's the wrong one. Routes here. You'll see it has a source airport ID and a destination airport ID. This, I'm actually giving you guys a pretty solid tip for the lab. Source airport ID, plane goes up. Destination airport ID, plane comes down. Uh, don't ask about some of those routes that have a, de a, a, a source but no destination. Plane goes up, never comes down. Um, but we can join routes on, I'm going to go uh, source airport ID. And now I can get fancy. I go where country, uh, country, because I renamed country. I'm pointing at my screen like you can see my screen. Because um, I renamed the country here. I can go country is equal to Canada. And now I'm running. And must be type Boolean. Oh. when you create a join clause and you don't actually finish writing it because you're too busy talking. Um, that was a good error message to see, actually. Um, argument of the join on must be a Boolean. This thing, this has, must evaluate to true for the join. All right, so I'm going to run this again. And we got another. Where country? Really? No, country. That's country. Oh, interesting. It's not letting me use the alias. MySQL lets you do this. Uh, Postgres doesn't let you. Okay, well, fine. We'll get, we're going to do it the explicit way. I don't have a problem with that. I prefer explicit anyways. So. so suddenly here we've got airports um, with countries. Interesting that we have a lot of repeats. So let's go airports oh uh, duh of course i've got lots of repeats i'm just saying you know give me airports where something takes off which is fine because that means sault ste marie has four routes 
Um, all right. So now I can go join airlines on airlines dot airline underscore uh, no airlines ID is equal to uh, routes dot airline ID. And over here, I'm going to throw on airlines dot name. And I bet you they're all Air Canada. Uh, country ID is now ambiguous because airlines also has a country. So I'm just going to get rid actually of country ID because I don't need it. And go. Ah, actually, pretty good. There we go. Now we can see Air Canada, Canada Bearskin, Bearskin, Porter. And then you got um, Canadian North, First Air, um, WestJet, Edmonton, so Japan Airline. Apparently, you can take a plane from Edmonton straight to Japan. Uh, KLM. So it's kind of cool. Now, I'm actually retrieving data from multiple tables at once with a single query. And you'll notice how quickly that's running. And this is just to show you guys that there's really no big limit on the joins. As long as the joins are valid, it's good. Now, there is a few gotchas that you need to be aware of. When a query is being interpreted, it goes from left to right. Left means character zero until it hits the end of the query, whatever character this is. And we'll read it from left to right, which means this is to the left of this, which is to the left of that. Now, some of you are probably wondering, well, why is that important? It's because of the order it reads it in. There is uh, very big limitations on um, the order of doing the joins. For example, you'll notice that we are connecting airports to countries, then routes, then airlines. I'm going to take the airlines one and move it right under airports. And we'll get an error message. Missing from clause entry for table routes. Because it reads it from left to right, it can only join to things that are already been defined. Because routes is being defined later, it's not to the left. It's to the right. So when you're doing joins, you can only join a table to another table that currently exists to its left. That makes sense. Order of precedence, right? You can only join to things that already exist. You want to go hang a door on your house? I guess you need to have a house first, right? Otherwise, you're going to be sitting there with a door going, I'm going to hang this door on a house, but I don't have a house yet. That's what it's saying is, you want data from this table, and you want to connect it to this table, but I don't know what this table is yet because it hasn't been defined as far as I'm concerned. So the order of the joins is important. So if you see this message missing from clause entry, it means that you probably have your joins in the wrong order and you need to, you know, figure out your shit. All right. So this leads me into outer joins. So these are so far have been inner joins. Much fun. Big wow. Um, works like a treat. So I'm going to make this a little simpler. I'm going to get back to uh, just the countries. No, actually, you know what? I'm going to just use routes. So I don't need countries. I don't need airlines. And I'm just going to pull out the route ID. And get rid of this. Okay. And uh, routes.id. We are back to a very simple query. Well, simplish. Now, what's nifty here is you'll notice it's coming back with 67,424. Now, if I go 
Um, actually, let's go with destination. Like this. 67421. If I do a left join, which is also known as a left outer join, you can you can skip the word inner and you can skip the word outer. If you don't have the word inner it is, and you don't have left or right, it assumes it's an inner join. The second you include the keyword left or right, it's an outer join. So left outer join, 72,253. And people are going, okay, that's a lot more rows. Let me show you why. Let's get right to the end. Come on, do it, do it, do it. Oh, come on. Oh, this is going to take forever. Yeah, let's go uh, order by root ID descending. I don't know if this is going to let me. Uh, does not exist. Roots. Oh, Dan. Roots ID. Right here. Null. If I do a regular join, we have 67421. So let me explain to you what's happening with the left join. Left join is basically stating, I want everything from airports connected to routes. However, I want all the airports, whether or not they have a destination route. That was planes take off from there, but they never land there. Okay, that's the difference between, you know, not having destination. But what's cool is it's showing you basically airports that, in this case, are never used as a destination. I don't know how the planes get there, if you can take off, but, you know. There's no destination at that air from that uses that airport. So when you do a left join or a right join, because you just flip it going the other way, right? Whatever you've got from airports is pulled and any matches from routes is given. Anything that is not matched, it gives you a null. So now some people are saying, well, what's the point of that kind of a query? A these kinds of queries are used for when you need to identify records that don't have values. For example, you have a list of customers, you have a list of orders. You want to know which customers have never placed an order. There's two or three ways to write that. A left join is an effective way where you go select star from customers, left join orders. Because what's really cool here is now we can go where roots.id is null. And that will give me the 4,832 airports that are never used as a destination. You could do the same thing with a customer list and a list of orders or a list of products that have never been sold. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when you do a left, okay, so a regular join is known as an equa join. So the values have to exist in both tables. That is an inner join. It will only return rows where there is a match. Period. A left join, or conversely, a right join, returns, I'll just use the left as the example, will return everything from airports and any matches it finds in routes. If it doesn't find matches, it will return null values for anything you're trying to pull from routes. Therefore, you'll get the whole list of airports regardless, and then nulls for whatever else. It's useful as a method of uh, identifying things that aren't being used in the data. That's the most common use for left and right joins. Or sometimes you'll have a case where um, you want to retrieve a customer and all their addresses or all their additional shipping addresses. You know, shop at Amazon, how you can define more than one shipping address. 
your default address is on your record. Any extra ones is probably in another table. Not everybody has extra addresses. So you could do a left join. So it always gives you at least the one address and then any extras coming from the other side. So when you're doing a left, it's saying, give me everything that's on the left. And any matches you have on the right, otherwise return nulls. So what do you think the right join does? Gives you everything from routes and any matches from airports. So we can actually try to see if there's actually uh, anything of that nature. Uh, that's definitely how you write the word right. So I do right join. It'll work because it's a valid join. Uh, where airport ID is null. Um, and we have some routes um, that don't have a, are not used as a destination, they're only used as a source. So these are basically destination airports um, or airports that are only used. Yeah, these are routes that don't have a des that never use as a destination. So you can use you know a variety of these things. You can play with it to your heart's content. So if I do it, the the left next left join will always work. So it's basically saying here is give me everything from routes, and give me any airports that match where the airport's used as the destination. And then I'm going is null is basically giving me all the routes that don't ha are never used as a destination. It's right and left are confusing. I have good news. Guess what's not in the lab? Uh, left and right joins are very targeted purpose. So we don't tend to do it a lot. Yep. Yeah, something like that. It's doing pattern matching on the address. Um, so essentially, you type in 112, and then it starts completing the address for you. It's searching through a complete, a complete address list, and it's building it for you. Not quite what this is doing. Um, this is more, this would be more used in business purposes and stuff where, um, for example, Amazon has tons of products that have never sold, ever. They'll run something of this nature to list all the products with a say a left join on the sales and then say now give me only the products that have never appeared in sales you could write this as a subquery absolutely easily as a subquery you could do it as a left join as a right join this is a lecture where suddenly people start realizing that no matter what you're trying to do in sql there's at least three ways to do it you figure out the way that works best for you and then you optimize it so that, you know, it might not be the best way because it might be expensive. Uh, joins are not expensive. Um, see, it grabs the airport, grabs the route. It has, does an anti-join because, you know, it's doing a right join. So it's the opposite of a join. Uh, it does the anti-join and it gives you a sort in the end. Um, it's really interesting how that works. So left join, right join, inner join, and you've seen a cross join. So you've seen all the major join types so far. Yeah. Oh, no, it's the database that's doing it. Uh, I mean, there's a few different ways. I'm not exactly sure what you're asking, but essentially if you're in an application and you're starting to browse the data, it's definitely running queries on the database. So, for example, you go to Amazon and you pull up an order. Actually, Amazon's not a good idea because uh, the way Amazon works is just weird. Um, T-Turtle. So I'm going to order some T-shirts off T-Turtle. They're great T-shirts. And you pull up an order and you'll have your, your order and then you'll have like four t-shirts on your order. And 
those four t-shirts are four separate order lines. So what's happening there, it's actually doing a join from orders to order lines to retrieve the appropriate order lines for your order. So that's that's a join. That's happening in the background in the code. It's hitting the the database server, it retrieves the records and gives it back to your application like this. Does that make it a little clearer? No. <laughs> he's, looking, he's looking a little confused. Yeah, the, the left and the right joins are not commonly used. They're really used for cleanup purposes and or very specific. Like I don't even off the top of my head have a reason to say use a left or a right join. The only time I've ever used them is when I suddenly realized I needed to use them because I needed all the data from table A and any matches from B, but I still needed to return a full row of data for both sides. Um, like I said, normally I use it to find things that haven't been touched in a long time. Um, but yeah, so really the only join I'm really worried about though, you guys at least get from this is this kind of join, an inner join. If you guys can grasp the inner join, I'm a happy camper. This is the, this type of join is used 99% of the time. Left joins, right joins, like they're used like 0.99% of the time. Cross joins are like 0 0.001 kind of thing. They're not used. Yeah. Yeah, they'll use uh, subqueries also, which uh, in theory I could use a subquery. I couldn't actually use a subquery to pull this out because I wouldn't get the root ID. Um, there's all kinds of ways to use joins. Um, but like I said, this is the most common use for a join. It is super efficient because the it it pulls from airports, it joins routes, and see this on clause. This is processed before it ever hits the where. That means by the time you hit the where clause, you've already reduced the data set, so it's operating on less data which is good because the less data you work with, the faster it's going to be. Oh, no, no, the, uh, no, I know, but the intersection table has the, the columns. Yeah. Yeah. So if I go join a uh, route aircrafts, on roots dot id is equal to roots no root aircrafts dot root id join aircrafts on aircrafts dot id is equal to dot aircraft ID and let's go with uh, aircrafts dot description. Let's see if I got this right on the first try. There. So root aircrafts is an intersection table. It intersects, or it's also known as an associative table or a bridge table. There's like three, four names for it. The roots aircraft connects the root to an aircraft, because each aircraft can be used on multiple routes. And theoretically, a single route could actually have multiple aircraft if it's a route that has multiple hops. Um, this is basically, that's how you do it. So you can see right here that um, root aircraft is the associative entity. So you got the root ID is the root's aircraft ID and the aircraft ID is aircraft ID. So if we were to open up Roots Aircraft, you'll notice that there's the two columns for the intersection. Yeah. Um, that may or may not be, you know, in one of the labs, this particular query. Um, 
So that covers the intersection table, but it's just another join. It's just the case. The hardest part of the doing the joins is figuring out how things are supposed to be connected. That's the hardest part, like after you get over the syntax issues. But once you got the syntax and you figure out how things are, are supposed to be interconnected, joins are a breeze. It's that first jump of, you know, learning how it's supposed to operate. That's challenging, <laughs> which is why lab nine is like, Lab six, lab seven, lab eight, lab nine. So the difficulty level goes up pretty quick. Um, because you can mix match almost every technique I just did today as a single thing. So I can go uh, airports.country ID in select. ID from countries where name in Canada, comma, France. And now we are pulling just the airports from Canada and France. I just literally in one, in one query just showed you everything today that I talked about in one query. So that's the last hour of me talking on one thing. I'm going to copy that, put it in the announcement so that you guys have it. Um, okay. That, so I don't lose it. Okay, let's go back to the slide deck real quick, make sure I didn't forget anything. Okay, join, primary key, foreign key, cool. So, you know, you can always refer to the slide if you get confused about the syntax, because the slide actually has points that talk about what I was just talking about. Um, yeah, I did that also. Uh, that's an on. And I show multiple joins. I did that. Uh, join on for two or three, three or more tables. I don't know why they needed to show like four slides saying you can do two tables, you can do three tables. Let's do another slide for four tables. It's all the same. One table, two table, 10 tables. It's all the same. You just got to do it in the right order. Um, so when two tables join, what this slide is showing is they basically took the data from the two data, the two tables and just slid them so that they line up. So you can see that the locker foreign key is 10, the locker primary key is 10, therefore it this the connection when it does the join. That's essentially what it's demonstrating. Um, this is one using uh, Venn diagrams and Venn diagrams are incorrect to use for this. Venn diagrams are actually used for the next topic in the slide deck. Um, but, you know, a lot of people like using Venn diagrams to explain how it works. Uh, so that's an inner join, which I talked about. Um, yeah, another version of an inner join. Left outer join, I demonstrated. Um, basically, it takes everything from the left and only matching rows from the right. If it's not there, returns a null, which I did discuss. Uh, order is important. The first table is the main from where all the other rows are connected from. So again, it reads from left to right. Anything you're joining must exist to the left of whatever you're writing. If you want to read it top to bottom, that's cool too, because that's technically still left to right. If you're joining here, whatever you're joining to has to exist before it. That's what this is talking about. Um, left outer join, I already covered that. Uh, right outer joins just the left, but it's just opposite. Um, so that's just more of that. So subqueries and joins process, process multiple tables. Um, that's the subquery can only return data from the outside table. Uh, the join is everything's a top table essentially because it's all part of the query. All right, the last topic for today, um, not for today, but from this slide deck. It is a very quick topic. It's like three slides. Uh, do you, did any of you guys remember doing sets in high school math? Data management? Does that ring a bell? Yeah, so we got one person that actually remembers high school math. Good job. About two, because somebody over there know, said yes also. Yes, good job. You remember high school math. When I went through school, that wasn't part of high school math. We actually, I was like grade 13 math like OEC math, like we had more math courses we had to take. 
So set theory means you are taking two sets of data and you're operating against them. Uh, Venn diagrams are a standard way of describing it. A set is represented by a labeled circle. A subset's a portion that is within the set. So we have three operators. We have the union, the intersection, and the complement. So a union means give me everything from both tables. But what it does is it says give me everything from table A plus anything you find in table B that's not in table A. Okay. The intersection is give me the values that exist in both tables. A bit like the join does. The complement is give me everything in A that is never found in B. It's think of it as a subtraction. So everything from pile A except what you find in pile B. Um, here's the Venn diagrams. Remember a minute ago I said how, you know, Venn diagrams are stupid for joins because they're supposed to be for sets. Some of you guys probably remember, you know, there's for a while Venn diagrams were a big meme. Some of the younger ones in here might not remember when Venn diagrams were a big meme, but you'd have, you know, um, you'd have a Venn diagram, you'd have a circle with, you know, ladies, another circle with cats, and then in the, the intersection was cat ladies. It was still bad, but you know, it is what it is. I mean, now it's just person, cat person, right? Uh, I mean, I've, I get to say it. I've got four cats, so you know, it's it's fine. I'm the cat person. Um, but essentially, the first one's the union, so it gives you everything from A and anything unique in B. So it's basically the result of both put together. The intersection is only what overlaps in both, and the complement is only what's in A that is not found in B. So give me everything from A, excluding anything you match in B. Um, so there's a few things we need to be careful with this. The co table columns must be have the same number of columns. You can't run set operations on mismatch number of columns. So table A has three columns, table B has two columns. You can't because they're not equivalent to each other. Doesn't mean they have to have the same data in them but the structure is not equivalent. And they must also have the same data type. So you can't compare an integer to a var car because, well, they're not the same thing. So union and intersect, we talked about. The complement is never called complement. In Postgres and Microsoft SQL Server, it's known as accept. In Oracle, it's known as minus. reasons. Um, so actually I have examples at the end there. So this is how you'd use them. You'll notice that with the union, go select first name, last name from customer, union, first name, last name from employee. So that's going to give me all the customers plus any employees that are not customers. If I do the intersect, it'll give me the customers that are also employees, or at least that have the same name. Except says, give me all the customers except for customers that are employees. So I just want to send out a discount and employees are not allowed to have the discount. That's the syntax for these. The good news is it's not even in the lab. That's why we, I go over it so fast. Realistically, what do you need to know about this for the exam? Actually, I don't even, I have to double check, but I'm pretty sure that's not even on the exam. Um, really, this should be a level two topic. But 300, you guys are in CP or CET. You don't get a level two database course unless you choose to take it. That's why we mentioned it here on the way by. Okay. So that's week 12. Week 13 sounds familiar because that's the views. Now we're going to talk about indexes. Mushy mushy.
All right, indexes. Ah, PowerPoint, why must you be that way? Indexes. Okay. Indexes. Purpose of indexes. So a lot of database queries only need a bit of data being pulled out of the database. But what if the only way to get the data out is if you did a full search of the entire database? It's really inefficient. Indexes help us speed up the queries so that we don't have to search the entire database. I have a really simple way to visualize this. Now, how many of you have actually gone to a library? Okay, good. God, that makes me sad. Because you know what? 15 years ago when I asked that same question when I started teaching this course, almost the whole class put up their hand. Okay. You, those of you that didn't raise your hand, you know what a library is, right? It's a place with lots of books in it. So how do you find the books in the library? You go to the little computer, and you type up some stuff. You don't find what you want. You walk over to the librarian and say, I'm trying to find books on this topic. And the librarian doesn't even touch the computer. They just walk out and go, there. The librarian's the index. It has, the librarian has cataloged the contents of their library basically in their head. If you got lucky and you actually managed to pull results from the little computer at the you know at the front of the library, often it'll give you some a code, right? Also known as the anybody remember what it's called? There it is. Thank God, at least one person here remembers the Dewey Decimal System. You know, you you look it up and it goes, it's in section ACE one three one dot four five B. So you go down the hall, right down the down the room, looking for AC. Then you find the number on the shelf, the shelf that applies that number, and then you dig down to where the book is going to be in that range. An index in the computer does something very similar, because imagine you didn't have the library and you didn't have the computer. How would you find the book? You'd have to walk through the entire library, shelf by shelf, until you found whatever book you're trying to find. Now. Picture this being even worse, where there isn't something like the Dewey Decimal System to help you find your way, where you have Romeo and Juliet right next to physics textbook, right next to the freaking Barney book, because it's totally randomly assorted. You have no idea where anything is. That's what it's like when the database server has to do what's called a table scan. When it tries to query and it doesn't find an index, it literally reads the whole database row by row by row. And it'll read the entire table. Even if it finds what you're looking for in the first five rows, it doesn't know for a fact. That's only the only version of it. So it's going to read the whole thing. So some really smart pocket protectors came up with indexes. So some of you guys know the word index. From a textbook, you open the textbook, you look up the topic at the back, it tells you what page to go to. Same idea. The database server has a structure inside of it that is used to speed up queries. They go really, really fast. Um, normally, no, let me phrase that. All primary keys are indexed. That's why Lookups of data by the primary key is fast because they're always indexed. Other columns are not indexed by default. Um, so basically, you got the primary keys, they're always indexed. You can index any other column to your heart's content. They're known as the secondary keys. You can do combinations of them. So an index. is arranged like this. The most common type of index is known as a B plus tree. And for years, I taught it to my students saying B stands for binary tree. 
And then one day I had a data, actually you had a, you know, I met, I ran into a, an actual data scientist who told me I was out to lunch. Uh, you know what B, the B tree, the B stands for in B tree? Best. Best plus tree. The way it works is it takes the data and it divides it in half. Then divides that in half. And each half gets divided in half again. Up to four layers deep. It can only ever go four layers deep. So imagine in this room, I said, I'm going to sort the students in this room by last name. A to M on the left, N to Z on the right. Now, the ones on the left, A to F, more to the left, more to the left, F to M here. N to S here, T to Z there. Then I take A to F, go A to C, D to F, break them down so that eventually it is basically you'll have just smaller subsets to look through. So it can fan out hundreds of levels wide, but it can only ever go four deep. So in theory, it'll divide it in half first and then in half again. But if there's a lot of values, it may, instead of going in half, it'll go in quarters, in thirds, usually in pairs. So in quarters, in eighths. So that's why you can have a hundred wide and only four deep. So if it's organized like this, um, this is what's basically called a tree search. And we are looking for flyers team, you know, the flyers. And we know that the first set goes from A to F. So we don't need to continue looking through P and Z. We just go A to F. Then it goes down. Now we go B to F. And then we know that A and B is first, and then we'd have, you know, C, D, E, and F. And F would go to the end, and then it would find flyers by jumping through the list shorter. Because instead of having to look through every values, it's only finding the values that match the criteria. And using the index, it's able to get through the list really, really fast because it's only using a subdivision process. Just like I say, guess a number between 1 and 10. What's your first guess? 5. And I'd say higher or lower. So what's your next guess if I go lower? Okay, I go lower. What's your, well, that, that, that's not good because it only goes two layers deep, right? Because at that point, you can go two and you got a 50-50 chance of getting it right. So you can always get the answer in four guesses. You can do a guess a number between one and 100, and you can usually get it in five guesses. Yeah, because it doesn't need to go past F. Like it goes to F. It jumps down to the next one, figures out where F is, jumps down to the next one. Maybe there's lots of Fs, so it split the Fs into FA through FM, and then FN through FR, and it, it goes, oh, it's FL, so it'll be in the first half. And it, it breaks it down like that. Now, when it's indexes that use numbers, literally, it does, is that what you're about to say? To ask, right? If it's numbers, it's literally doing that example of guess of a number between one and 100. 50, 25, 12, 6. And then if we had 100 numbers, but we in three guesses, we got to the point where we only need to look at three numbers to get the answer, that's pretty fast. Regardless, you could always get it, get it you know, within three guesses, you can get down to three digits. That, why do you think that's called a B tree? Right? That's why I thought it was a binary tree for years. <laughs> Until I was told that no, it's best tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why I called it binary tree for years until I was corrected by a data scientist. And it's a B tree. B tree stands for, you know. Eh? Hey? Uh, yeah. Yeah, he had a lot more uh, PhD. He had a PhD in the papers to prove that he actually knew what he was talking about. You know, it's like one of those things where, you know, you talk to someone you know they're significantly smarter than you. And you're like, 
You know what? I'm going to believe whatever you say right now. <laughs> okay, so we have unique indexes, normally used for primary keys, and non-unique indexes, they're usually used for secondary keys. Unique indexes uh, can also be used for other fields. For example, let's say you have a table where you never want a person to put in an email address twice. You could make the email address unique. It's not the primary key, but you could make that a unique index, which means when it goes in, each value can only ever exist once in that index. If you try to put it in twice, it throws up. Do you have a question? Well, it's imagine if if everything on your hard drive was off alphab in alphabetical folders. C, then it's A to F, you know, and then you have to go into each of the folders to find your stuff. That's what the index does. But yeah, pretty much. Actual fact: um, there's an operating system years ago called OS2. No, sorry, BOS. Um, most of you probably have never heard of BOS. Uh, BOS is what um, um, the founder of Apple, when he got kicked out, went and created. So uh, whatever his name was. Steve Jobs, when Steve Jobs left, was left, told to, be, tend to, tell, told to go away. He found a new company called B, and they had an OS called BOS. The entire file system was a database. Like, unlike Windows, which has like hidden stuff on the disk that tells it where the files are, it actually queried a database. You could actually write SQL to find your files. Um, actual fact, Windows actually has an SQL file system available to it. Uh, it never really, really released publicly, but there is an SQL file system for Windows where all the files are in a table. And you can Literally, there's SQL to find your files. Yeah, that's not a topic for this class. That's like a, that's an entire lecture for web development. Just I'm I'm not even going to go into the field. That's we we're going way off topic. But you'd have a backup. You you create a database. You upload the the backup just like you did for Flight DB. That's that's the short version of what I could talk about for two hours. Okay, let's try to finish this topic. So the syntax create a unique index is create unique index. You give it a name on. You give it what table and what field is being applied to. It looks a lot like creating a constraint. It's the same syntax as creating a constraint, except it's an index. You want to create a non-unique index? It's just the keyword unique. You can index multiple columns. Um, so here's the short version of that. Create name index on person name. That means the names will be indexed. Searching for names will be faster. Now, you can create indexes on more than one attribute. So I'm going to create a double index on, and that name of the index will be whatever you want, on person, age, city. So if I were to run a query where it goes age is equal to 55 and city is equal to Seattle, that index will help. But it will not help with the bottom one because indexes have to be used in their entirety. So the query optimizer, will come in and look for any indexes that matches things you may have in your where clause. And then it tries to pick the best index. If it can't find an index that matches something in your where clause, it will not use an index at all. It'll do a full table scan. So row one, row two, row three. The reason why it doesn't help with the bottom query 
is because we don't have an index that's only city. The only index we have is age and city combined. If we were to create another index just for city, it would help with the bottom query. And it would help with the middle query because city is there. There's an index for just city, but it would still have to table scan for the 55. So it would reduce it to, to, to Seattle and then table scan the rest to find the 55s. Now, I'm actually, uh, I don't think I have time for that topic today. So I'd rather spend a few minutes more talking about indexes. I'll talk about transactions to start next week's lecture before I do the, the final review. Or what passes for review with me. Okay, so a few things that they don't talk about in these slides. And I know I used to have slides for this before the, all the slides got redesigned. And as you can tell, they're not really well redesigned if you look at the footer of that slide. So indexes are great. They make things go fast. I'll give you an example. Um, my previous job, we had a database that had a, a fair amount of data, not a huge amount of data, but there was a lot of joins. And one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that foreign keys do not get indexed by default. So suddenly we had a lot of joins and you had to do table scans on the foreign keys. And the more joins you have, the more foreign keys are involved, the more table scan. Query was taking 10 minutes. The guy who wrote the code says, I'll get around to optimizing it later. Meanwhile, I'm watching our, our, our database instance on Amazon spiking to 85% every time somebody loaded this one web page. And it sat there for minimum 10 minutes. But how many of you have ever gone to a website where it takes a little long to load and you hit the refresh button? People were hitting refresh three, four, five times and now running four or five copies of this one query in parallel. CPU is now spiking to 100%. Now, I know nobody in here really knows how things work in Amazon land, or very few of you do. Amazon has something called CPU credits. When you have CPU credits and you have an expensive job, it starts eating credits to give you 100% CPU utilization. So you get the full performance of what you're paying for. When you run out of credits, it goes to slow mode. We ran out of credits one day. You know, once, you, once it calms down, the credits start building back up, but we ran out of credits one day. I spent three minutes looking at the queries. I created three indexes. We went from 10 minutes to 14 seconds. That's what an index is good for. That's one thing. So things you index, fields that are regularly queried. For example, email address, phone numbers, postal codes, that kind of thing. Foreign keys, always index foreign keys. Don't be a bad database designer. There's no reason not to index the foreign keys. It's free performance. But it's not free because there's a catch. Yeah. Um, it's when you're creating the tables or after you created tables, you create the indexes. Normally, you don't want to create the indexes until, especially if you're going to load a lot of data into the database, you want to create the indexes at the end uh, because I'm about to explain to you why indexes are not free. Indexes have two big gotchas, three, three big gotchas. The first one is if you have too many indexes, the query optimizer gets confused. Because if you have overlapping indexes, it goes, I've got three indexes that satisfy this query. I don't know which one to use. Fuck it. Table scan. Database servers are designed by default to be conservative. If it can't, doesn't know what to do, it's going to default to the slower true and tried method. Too many indexes causes confusion. There's different database servers have different ways of allowing um, index hinting, what's called an index hint. So you can say on this join, use this index. On this query, use this index. So that if you happen to know, great, very few people use that. 
That's risk number one. Risk number two is disk space. Indexes take room. Not a lot of room, but it's room. Yes, we all have computers with terabyte drives, 500 gig drives. Amazon charges you uh, $42 a month for 100 gigs on a database server, for example. Cool. Doesn't sound like that much. Well, for students, it might be a lot, but you know, for a company, it's not much. But indexes use up some of that space. So let's say you have a table that occupies one megabyte. And you have 10 indexes. Each index occupies 110k. We're suddenly at the index is actually occupying more space than the actual table. Indexes use up room. With today's data prices, it's really cheap, but that's not the point. It's just room. Which leads me to risk of indexes number three. IO operations. A lot of people don't think about I.O. operations. And most of you are going, what the hell is an I.O. operation? I.O. operation means input-output operation. How many times does a database server need to touch the disk when you add a row? So I'm going to use my dead batteries here as my example. Okay, So I've got a table, no indexes. I'm going to write a single piece of information. That was fast, right? I now have a table with five indexes. I write my row of data. Hmm, is this data over here? Oh, wait, I got another index. Oh, wait, I got another index. Oh, wait, I don't need to worry about this one. Oh, I got another index. Every trip to the disk takes time. The computers are really fast. Now imagine inserting a million rows. And for every I.O. operation, for every insert, let's say you have five indexes. It's going to do a read to figure out where to put the row. It's going to do a write. It's going to do a read to find if there's another index. Oh, I got a list of indexes. Fantastic. Index number one, do I need to write to you? Good. Read the index, place the value, write the value to the index. Index number two, rinse and repeat. So we went from, you know, three operations and you write a row to having a, you know, a single index adding another five to 10 operations. You have 10 indexes. You just added. 50 to 100 more operations because you're just trying to put in a single row of data. Doesn't mean don't use indexes. Trust me, they're worth it. Just don't abuse them because it slows things down. Because while the first row writes, all the other rows have to wait. Operation, write operation one completes. Good. Let's go do number two now. And it's going to do all those things all over again. Then it's going to do number three, all those steps all over again. Obviously, it's much more optimized in the computer and some you know, really smart pocket protectors have come up with ways to make that way more efficient. But that is the essence of what is happening. And when I'm talking about the read-write operation, when I read the index, it's got to figure out where to put it in the tree. So it looks at the value and it literally walks the tree to where it should be and then puts it in that block. Every once in a while, you have to do maintenance on your indexes because you deleted rows, but it doesn't take them out of the index. So you have to vacuum your indexes, or also known as index rebuilds. Guess what that does? It takes time. You do that at night. So this is just me talking about things that are not in the slide. So obviously, it's not in the exam, but these are important concepts to know that there's indexes is free performance, but it's not free. Like a lot of people will create lots of indexes, they abuse indexes, and then they wonder why their queries suddenly get slower, even though they're using indexes. Because they have too many indexes, too many complicated indexes, they have their slow disks, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, 
So next week I'll be talking about transactions. That's a topic. Um, not we took it out of lab nine, uh, lab ten. So you don't have transactions is not in the lab. So I'm not too worried about it. You officially, as of today, have everything you needed to finish assignment two. Literally, the joins was the only thing you were missing for assignment two. You have no reason not to finish on time. I covered that last week. We did. Yeah. Yeah, hang on. Let me check the calendar. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's December 3rd. Because you have to demo in lab that week. Okay? So next week, I will be covering the last of week 12. Probably take me a little over half an hour. I'll be talking about the final exam. The week after, I got nothing. No problem. No, the week after. I, I will be here if you have questions.